in Jesus name we have prayed that amen is too paralyzed I pray for you the God of remembrance shall be your God in this month Jehovah will remember you the way he has remembered this sister as many people that look down on you as many people that have vowed that your life will never go forward in this month such people shall become your stepping stone to greatness and so shall it be in the name of jesus can we clap for jesus just go ahead clap for the king of kings for the Lord of Lords, the ancient of days, the beginning and the ending. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen to me. When God wants to help a man, he will send a man to him. Amen. Yesterday we were taught about destiny helpers. Permit me to tell you that the special guest we have in the house tonight is such a man Amen. listen to me when god wants to help you he will give you the heart of your destiny helper Amen. that whatever you ask whatever may be the demand the destiny helper will have no option than to say and to be saying no problem no problem listen to me god has so much favored us god has so much honored us that god brought us in contact with a man such as this man here there are fathers and there are fathers His grace, the retired Archbishop Luke Orumbi, is not only a father, he's a father to fathers. Amen. Just as you keep clapping, let's welcome His grace, the retired Archbishop Luke Orumbi. Keep clapping, keep clapping, keep clapping. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. You may sit down. Thank you very much. Pastor Ben, give me a single permission. It's my request that you stop calling me a special guest. I think by now you can easily call me my kinsman because I believe I belong. <laughs> by the time you know a brother, by the time you appreciate a brother, by the time you understand a brother, he ceases to be a visitor. Amen. Maybe the only thing that can remain and is from the Bible, he remains a friend. Amen. He remains a friend because Jesus called his disciples friends. Because I have shared with you what the, the Father commanded me. Beloved, I thank God that I came. I came from Nebi yesterday afternoon, arriving in my own home in Mokono around 4-ish. I left my wife not very well. This morning I called her. She was sparkling. She was very happy. Which means that the malarial attack had already gone. And she has come back to health. She sent you greetings. You receive it, would you? Let me give you kingdom news. 
The last time we were in Protea, I think it was 25th of July. I was coming from Austria and Germany. I went there for ministry. Prior to that, I was in Tanzania, in Kagera region. You remember Kagera very well because we went and bombed Kagera. We Ugandans went and bombed Kagera. And then we got it more than we asked for because that helped the Tanzanians to release the hands of Amin from the reign of leadership, a reign of terror from this country. We went to the Lutheran church bombed by our Air Force. And we knelt there and we repented of the cruelty and unnecessary carnage of our country to the people who are innocent of the Kagera region, our neighbors. We asked the Lord to forgive us Ugandans. This is many years ago, many years ago. Then we went way out towards Burundi border. And as I speak now, I know Burundi is not quiet. A number of those people are into that area now as refugees. One week we spent there. We arrived on the 6th. It was a Monday. The very following day, we drove towards Lake Victoria, 200 kilometers from where we started. And we slept in the hotel being built by the present, the present president of Tanzania. And we were told this man, John Mugafuli, I think that is his name, is a strong runner for presidency. We slept in his hotel. We prayed for him. We asked God's blessing on his life. So when I learned he was elected president of Tanzania, I said, but I slept in your hotel. <laughs> then we went back to this place up called Ngara and spent the rest of the time ministering in Tanzania. August, we were in Arua for youth convention. Towards the end of August, we were in Lira for another youth convention. September, we were in Uganda Christian University for a whole week, reaching out to the students and faculty, part of which to the campus here in uh, Kampala. Then we closed down, spent October re recuperating. At my age, I'm 66. You need to go strong, but you also need to slow down for a little longer than the younger people. And so I finished. Now I'm out again. Now, your pastor, Ben, is a man with a determination when he knows what he needs. He's a man who, when he's decided, you can never turn him around. I think only heaven works on him. He asked me to come, and I said, I'm not sure, because Saturday, my wife is going to celebrate her birthday, 14th. But the permission of my wife, she says, you can go, and then when you come back, we can celebrate my birthday. I came here because I believe that when a man is raised of God, God raises men to hold his arms the way Har and Aaron did for Moses. I keep telling him, brother, I am here to only help you. I am here to stand with you. I'm here to support you. I was sharing with him recently. Somebody told me, but that guy is cultic. That guy has a cultic church. I said, I don't know about Celtic Church. I've been to that church. I hear the gospel is being preached. I heard the gospel being preached. I went and preached the gospel there. So all I know is that it's a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, and... Why can't you let me finish? Spirit-anointed church. If I go to a place and I feel at home, our spirits are connecting. And so, Brother Ben, let me reassure you, because I did it before. I will stand with you. I will be with you whenever a need arises. This is my country. You came to us. We must host you until your mission is done. And when the Lord takes you next to another place, which he will, because your movement will begin to be a bit rapid very soon. We know that what you are starting here by the help of God is not going to stop where we are. It's going to grow. So I am here. As long as the Lord hasn't come, we are going to be together. So I believe that you will always know when to get me. And when you know it, you will get me and I will come. Allow me to pray. Father, I'm excited about the message you gave me. I agonized over this message. I got thrilled about this message. 
I looked to you about this message and you said, give it to them. Now I stand here in the pulpit to give this very message to your people. Lord, I ask for open hearts. I ask for open ears. I ask for willing spirits. I ask that people will listen. Faith will build up. The faith in the Jehovah God to whom they should look at all time. Lord, will you release me to speak this message? And Lord, will you give me the freedom to do so, I ask you. And may your glory and your presence come into this sanctuary, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. On Saturday, we go to Barara. We have one week ministry in Barara. These are election times. The fever is rising up. But God sent us to Mbarara last year in November. The dates were known by last year in November. And I was invited last year in November. God's timing is always perfect. Will you pray with us? We are reaching out to Bishop Stewart University, Mbarara University of Science and Technology, Ntare Secondary School, Mbarara High School, the municipality, Bank of Uganda, the, the people around us, we are going to reach all those guys. I want, to, I want to trust you will pray for us. I want to trust you will be honest to say, yes, we shall pray for you. Then I want to pray that you pray not only for me, there is another brother preacher with me. It's Dr. Drake Adupa from Lira. He's a gynecologist, he's a senior consultant, a Bible preacher and a guy who does a scientific thing and a theological thing together. He has been with me since last year. We are preaching together. We went to Tanzania together, and he's coming with me to Mbarara. Please pray for us. I know God has a portion for them. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 28. Let's look together, beginning from verse 1. I want us to read up to verse 5 and verse 10, up to 22. So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him. Then he commanded him. Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of your mother's father Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now reside as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob. Move to verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth and with this top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised. When Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set up as a pillar. And he poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. Though the city used to be called Luz or Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear. So that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. 
And this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Beloved, I even don't think you need preaching after reading and listening to this message here. But let me expound this message to you tonight. Because that message speaks to Jacob, speaks to individuals who are here. That message, I, Henry Luke Corombi, have lived it and have experienced it. This is a message you can't miss, Living Word Assembly. Amen. This is a message which is geared to you, Pastor Ben, Mama Charity. This is a message geared to every single person who worships in this church. Amen. This is a message geared for you if you are a believer and you don't worship in this church. This is also your message tonight. I want you to pay attention because this is a very powerful, life-changing, transforming message. And God is going to make it easy for you to understand. It. Let's look at, look at your theme. Ebenezer. Thus far, the Lord has brought us, has blessed us, has carried us. This is a journey. A journey that started 10 years ago. We are, we are in 10 years, the 10th year. And 11th is going to start to another 10 years, that will be 20. Another will start to another 10 years, that will be 30. That will be another 10, and then it will be 40. Then, after 50, you are going to celebrate a jubilee. Amen. And many of you will be there. Many of you will celebrate the jubilee of this church. Because the foundation of this church is on a rock-solid rock. And this rock will never be moved by circumstances, by people's scheme, by people's malice. Because what God planted, what God planted himself, God nurtures. And when God nurtures a thing, it must bear fruit. That's why I'm looking at a sub-theme and my sub-theme says, The Lord walked with Jacob a journey of faith. The Lord walked with Jacob a journey of faith. If you want to know faith, look at Pastor Ben. Look at his dear wife. Listen to their stories. They've already given me two copies of your magazine. I can't read it in the office. I must sit down properly and listen and read properly. The journey of faith is a journey of a believer, a journey of a Christian leader, a journey of a family, a journey of a nation. So the Lord walked with Jacob a journey of faith, and we have read the text. You remember that this man called Isaac was the only son of his father. You remember he came to his father when the father was 100 years old. You remember his mother was so old that when heaven announced a year from that time she would be having a baby, a baby boy, she laughed. She's laughing because her system had existed and they finished. She was no longer a normal woman. She was only waiting for the end of the candle to burn and she will go. In other words, she's saying, God, are you really serious about my condition? Do you really know what I'm talking about? Of course, God made you and God knew you. A year after that, she cuddled a baby. And she called the baby Isaac. And Isaac simply means laughter. Two types of laughing. The first laughter was of self-pity. And then the second laughter was rejoicing and thanksgiving. A number of you will shift from laughing, a laughter of self-pity, to a laughter of joy and celebration. <laughs> Ten years ago, when people looked at your church in Bunga, they scorned it. They laughed at it. They ridiculed it. Ten years down the road, they can't do it. If you're not a member, you can't do it anymore. The laughter of scorn, self-pity is gone. Now things are getting better. Now, there were two sons to Isaac. His other, the wife was called Rebecca. That is a very wonderful story. When she was pregnant, this woman, the pregnancy was not a steady pregnancy, peaceful pregnancy. And she went to the man of God and said, please help me. This pregnancy is a real bother. The Lord said to her through the man of God, that there are two nations jostling for control in your womb. But the younger will be the one to be served by the older. There are two nations in you. The amazing thing was labor pain hit the woman. She began to push. The first, the first child who came out was reddish. 
full of hair. The second child who came out was holding the heel of the first son. The old boys. Now this second boy who held the heel of the elder brother is called Jacob. The one who came out and was reddish is called Esau. Now this is the same Jacob, you know his story. That when one time he was in the kitchen and he was cooking a reddish bean, making soup of beans. The brother is an outward man. He used to go out and hunt animals, a very well beaten by weather. A guy who is tough, a guy who is weary, a hairy and he was very masculine. Jacob was a domesticated young man, always with the mother. Always tending to domestic affairs. So some I was a mother's boy. This guy came out from the field and he was so hungry, the kind of hunger that cannot be controlled. And then he found his brother. The brother was making a stew of beans. I'm talking about beans. B-E-A-N-S. Then he asked for some of that to be eaten. He was very hungry. Now, this young man who held the heel of his brother said to his brother, If you want this soup, give me your birthright first. Make me the firstborn. Make me the elder boy. And Esau said to him, that's not my problem. My problem is hunger, and I need something to eat to quench my hunger. You can take that birthright. I don't even know what it is anyway. By the time I came out, I didn't even know where, who I was. You can take it. Stupid. Doesn't understand. Doesn't know anything. Lacks wisdom in his heart. Lacks common sense in his head. He was given bean soup in exchange for his birthright. Today, I could preach a sermon on that. I will not. But you know from that day on, he lost it. So then when time came for him to receive the blessing, father said, so my son Esau, he said, yes, sir. Go back into the bush. Get for me game meat. I want you to cook it the way you normally do. I want to eat it and I want you to bless you. Yes, sir. Got his bows and arrows, went into the bush. Mother was listening. Mother went and told the younger boy who is he, her boy and said, you better do it quickly and my son do it the way I tell you. Get a kid, I want to prepare it and I want to give you, to take to your father because your father is going to bless your brother. Receive that blessing. He said, no, I can't. Mommy, it will be a curse. She said, let the curse be on me, not on you. Do what I have said. And then the boy, he did. He went, got a kid, they prepared it and his skin is smooth. So mama brought some skin of this kid, put it around where it is smooth, brought the clothes of this, the son Esau, dressed him up, and gave the food to him. When he came to dad, he said, I'm here, I am back, you are, you are, you are, God blessed me, I got the animal, I got the meat, I am ready. The dad listened to this man. He could not see very well, his eyes were almost gone. He said, your voice belongs to Jacob. But come near, let me kiss you. And as he came, now, if you are partially blind, your sense of smell is very powerful. So when the boy came to, to kiss father, he smelled the clothing of Esau on him. He said, this is very funny. Let me touch you. And he touched the skin of the, of the goat. He said, but you smell like Esau. Although your voice is Jacob, but of course, the food was also very tempting. The smell is good. He, he ate the food. I'm really running through a very long story. He ate the food and he blessed Jacob. He blessed Jacob. He blessed him with all the blessing, 100%. When Jacob went and gone, Esau appeared, prepared his meal, took it to his father, and offered the, offered the food. The voice is the same man. The clothing is the same man. The smell is the same man. And Isaac, or Isaac, could have had a heart attack. He could not believe how Jacob would come and take the blessing of the, of the brother. The brother wept. He said, Dad, even one. He said, I give you it all. Blessings have gone. Let, let me tell you, when God blesses you, it is 100% blessing. He blesses you totally. And let me say this to you also because I walked in it. When God blesses you as a person, the blessing is on your, on your life and on your head. No matter where you are, that blessing goes with you. This sister who is in Karamoja, praying to the God of the pastor, that blessing has gone with her from Kampala to Karamoja. Amen. Blessings that have followed her will follow you wherever you are. Amen. Abraham was blessed of God. They parted company with Lot, his nephew. Lord took the very large fertile land along the river Jordan. He went into the desert. And let me tell you, even in the desert, God blessed Abraham much more than the young men who chose the, Nile, the valleys of River Jordan. 
your blessing is in your life your blessing is in your head now i want you to receive a blessing tonight and i want you to receive it like a greedy child holding the breast of a mother full of milk and you're going to drink it and i want you to know it will be yours until you die i give you another reason i give you another reason when solomon asked for wisdom god gave it to him and gave it to him a hundred percent he was not a godly man. He married 700 wives. He married 300 concubines. He went away to the gods of his wife, but his wisdom still remained there. His wisdom still remained in him until his dying day. We are told he was the wisest king that, that the world had ever produced because of God who blessed him. So God should bless you tonight. Amen. Do you know Isaac blessed his son? Look at the blessing. Let's look at the blessing. Verse 2, go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel, which is your grandfather. Take a wife for yourself there, and among the daughters of Laban, your uncle. Look at verse 3, may God Almighty bless you. Blessing number 1, make you fruitful. Increase your number until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham. Father, thank you that fruitfulness is for us to take. Amen. That you want to lavish out of your generous heart, lovingly on us because you are not a selfish God. You give to your people. And this man is blessing his son with fruitfulness. And he's blessing his sons to make his descendants be the kind of descendants who are going to be meaningful in life. So he blessed him. God was saying to me, Pastor Ben, that your church is going to know growth. And I'm so impressed you went to Korea in a seminar for church growth. Your church is going to know growth. You are going to multiply in number. And I'm talking about 1, 2, 10, 20, 1,500, 1,000 people. You are going to multiply in number. The blessing is from the Lord for a humble man like you, who is willing to come and be here to, to find the God of the Nigerians, even in Uganda. Yeah. Isaac is giving the blessing to his son, the blessing of fruitfulness. And he blessed him so much so that when, they left, when he left home, let me tell you, he was traveling and he was traveling to his uncle's home and he was alone. A single young man, by himself he's alone he's alone i'm telling you some of you are alone you are not yet married you're alone you're like jacob at this point i will ex i will explain something that god will do for you and i'm going to explain it in this manner when the lord sees you walking single faithfully single the lord meets you with a package and that package is called fruitfulness. And it is for you to open it at your own time. He was not only single, but he was afraid. Because his brother wanted to kill him. Fear was in his heart. He did not know what was ahead of him. And he was alone and defenseless. He thought he was alone, so he, think, he thought. So this young man, when he went, and then he was overtaken by darkness. The sun set. We are told in verse 10, look at verse 10 of chapter 28. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Was there any home to go to? There was no family around. Was there anywhere to lodge in? There were no lodges and hotels around. Was there the king's palace somewhere to sleep at the gate? None at all. Was there any place of worship so that he could sleep in the veranda? Nothing. He stopped because it was dark. I don't know how he knew the way, but he stopped because it was dark and there was nothing. I don't know how much courage you guys have. But most of us, we find darkness really hard. We find blackouts in the city very, very hard. If you get into your house and there is no power and you have no candle, every imaginable thing begins to come in your mind. This young man is going to lie down with a roof called the sky and the lights called stars. This young man is not going to sleep on a bed. A spoiled young man who was mother's boy is sleeping on hard ground for a bed. A hard ground for a mattress, a hard ground for bed sheets and 
in their area during the night is really cold. This young man cannot even now afford a pillow. The Lord Jesus tells me foxes have holes, parts of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He has a pillow, and the pillow is called a stone. Very uncomfortable night. Very difficult place. You remember, he's running away from his father. No, no, from his brother. But now he's alone in the dark. Now, every danger is around him. Every problem is around him. This young man, I cannot imagine him anymore. He's not now the vivacious young man, full of confidence because he's blessed by his father. No. He is a weakling in his heart and he's trembling in his heart. That's why God met him. He had a dream. Look at verse 12. Now, dreams are real and dreams will speak to some people. Look at verse 12. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway. A stairway is American. It's a ladder, English. He saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. He saw something else. He saw angels of God. Look at the angels. They were ascending and descending on the ladder. He also saw something else. In verse 13, there above it stood the Lord, and the Lord said, I am the Lord, the God of your father. Not fathers. The God of your father. Look at this. Abraham is your father, Jacob. Abraham is the one who received my first blessing, Jacob. But he is now your father. And yet the biological father is called Isaac. But your father is not Isaac. Your father is Abraham. Because we are talking about blessing. And you are going to receive the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham. Now for me, by this time, I find that this is a trembling moment. Why should Abraham be a father even to date? We are not grandchildren of Abraham. We are the children of Abraham by faith. We walk in the footsteps of Abraham, a man of faith. I want you, I want you to understand something God is going to impart in you. And that is going to be faith. The blessing of faith. One day I was uh, woken up by my friend, a Pentecostal pastor, in 1972. 1972, way back. He walked into my house. He said, Brother Henry, I had a dream. I said, what dream did you have? He said, I, I saw you had a huge snake. And you have cut that snake to pieces and you hung it up. The snake was defeated. I said, what does that mean? He said, Henry, you're going to walk by faith, and you're going to walk in faith, and the enemy will never succeed to dislodge you from where you will stand to also divert your direction where God is going to put you. The gift of faith has been given you, he said to me. I was a young, unmarried fellow. I received the message. Like I would love you to receive every message tonight. Amen. Abraham, the man of faith. Is your father, Jacob. Is your father. And then Isaac. Then he's saying to, he look at verse 13 again, because that is a beautiful verse. In verse 13 he said, There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I'm the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying on. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and east, to the north and south, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Hallelujah. Amen. Ugandans, Ugandans, Kampalans, I want you to receive this word. I want you to receive the word of God. Because this word of God given to Jacob was given to Abraham, but was also given, go to Genesis chapter 1. You see where it started. Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and birds in the sky, over the livestock, all of the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Look at verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky. And over every living creature that moves on the ground. That was the original blessing. 
to Adam and to Eve. That was the original blessing to humanity when they were in the Garden of Eden. That is the business of God. Before God puts somebody somewhere, he gives him a home. Before he created Adam and Eve, he created the Garden of, of Eden. Before he gives him descendants, he says to him, the land on which you are, you are lying on is yours. Before your descendants can come. Pastor Ben, I believe very strongly that the church you are going to be built is going to be built on a bigger property than you have right now. Amen. Because the number of people coming to your church will need space for parking, for all other things that will accompany that church. The Lord has given you this land in this country. The Lord has given you space in this country. The Lord is going to bring you Ugandans and other people into your ministry. And the Lord will first of all give you the land. And then when he gives you the land, then the people will come. And when the people come, the sanctuary and related buildings will be built by people. Because God is going to put a seed tonight. The Lord bless you. That is your word. Do you realize that God is speaking to Jacob for the first time? Before, Isaac gave him blessing, and he blessed. And then later on, as he was living, his father gave him blessings. But for the first time now, God is speaking to this young man himself. God is going to speak to you himself. The pastor will bless you. But God will want to bless you as an individual. God wants to put his hand on your life himself. He's going to speak to you. Lord, I ask that you'll open ears. I was in Bali way back in 1973. I was seated. I was in a, I was in a guest house called St. Andrew's Guest House in Bali. I began to hear God in a much more tangible, clear way. He came. He stood behind my, my chair and he began to tell me, he said, my son, I want you to go into ordained ministry. Ordained ministry simply means you're going to put on this collar. I want you to go in your church. He said to me one thing, don't look for promotion. I will promote you. Don't look for money. I will supply everything you need whenever you have a project. And then finally he says, if you will remain faithful to me, I will keep my promise to you. Three things, 1973, in the month of August, I can still remember like it was yesterday. I wrote all these things down. Now these are many years down the road. I was a young man, I was a school teacher, I was just married. I heard God speak, I could not, I could not see him, I felt his presence standing behind me, my beloved. Lord God, I ask you, start speaking to people one by one. Let them listen to you. Now listen to me. You better say the Lord says, not the pastor says, the Lord says, the Lord says, the Lord says, the Lord says. Now from now on, Jacob is going to say, not my dad, but the Lord said. The Lord said the land on which I'm lying down on will be mine and my descendants. The Lord said my descendants will be like dust. Now dust simply means so many numerous descendants. And God is speaking. Now, do you, have you ever asked yourself why there was a ladder which started down here and then went up to heaven? Why wasn't it a highway, for instance? Why wasn't it a rope? Why a ladder? I ask God, I say, Lord, what is it all about? A ladder and the angels, do you notice the, the, the direction of the angels? They were ascending and descending. Which means the angels were already with Jacob, he didn't know. So they went up from where he was to where the Jehovah God was, and they came down to where he was, up and down. Let me ask you a question. Did the angels need the ladder? No, they don't. For them, they have wings. Did Jehovah need the ladder? No, he doesn't. He's already at the top of the ladder. Who needs the ladder? Jacob. Who needs the ladder? You and me. We need the ladder. Now, what is the ladder then? I asked the Lord, what is the ladder? He said to me, the ladder is your faith that will grow moment by moment as you come towards me day by day as you climb you see you can't climb ladders three four times at a go no one after another and you keep ascending and you keep going towards jehovah god 
The Lord is opening up for him an opportunity to fellowship with him, to walk with him, to be his own, just as he is the God of his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and now him, Jacob. This is a great gift I have seen the Lord, giving to mankind the gift of faith without which it is impossible to please God. Now this ladder is your walk of God towards God day by day. Now let me see how Paul unpacks it for you. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, look at what Paul says. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. I love the way Paul helps us to understand complicated uh, aspects of the scripture and makes it simpler for us to understand. Verse 10 says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I want to know Christ. I want to participate in the sufferings. I want to know the power of his resurrection and be part of the suffering that he went through and in that process become more like Jesus. How many of you have been walking with Jesus for 10 years? Let me see your hand. 10 years. Put it down. How many have been walking for 20 years? Let me see you. 20 years. You walked with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. How many of you have been walking for 30 years? Let me see you. Praise the Lord. How many of you have been walking for 40 years with the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay. That, that leaves me alone. I, I have been walking with him for the last 48 years. 48 years. When I started in 1967, when I started in 1967, five years along the road, he came, me, he came and brought me to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A red-blooded Anglican. He brought me to that level. I had climbed those ladders with him up to that point. Then he filled me with his Holy Spirit. Things began to happen. I have been walking with him up to this point. Now Paul is saying, I want to be like him. I want to become like him. When they look at me, they need to look at Jesus in me. When they hear me talk, they need to listen to Jesus in me. I want to attain to the point, whether it be sufferings, but I want to be ultimately like Jesus. Like Jesus. Now that's the blessing God has given you to be like Jesus. If there is anything that God is looking for, is for Ugandans who will walk to Jesus and be like Jesus and he will keep on sanctifying you. Peeling off the old you day by day, moment by moment. You see, if you take a stock, December last year to December next month, and you are still worse than what you are last year. Friends, check your steps. Which ladder are you on? Are you climbing down? Are you climbing up? We want to climb up. The, the higher we go, the nearer the Lord we are, the clearer the Lord is, the more of his aroma fills our lives, the more like him we become, and we keep on, on imitating him because we can see more clearly as we walk day by day with him that's how you deal with ladders your faith should be growing day by day day by day moment by moment i saw this i said lord i thank you for this revelation because it's helping me to understand paul says in verse 12 the same book in chapter 3 verse 12 he said these words and this is yours too not that i have already obtained all this not yet not yet not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. Listen to him. But I press. I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I press on, beloved. It can be tough. It actually gets tougher the older you grow in faith. It gets tough. But I keep pressing on. I am not going to quit. I am not going to desert. I will keep pressing on until I get hold of that which Christ has got hold of for me. I want to push on there. I want to get there. Look at verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ where Jehovah is seated right at the top. That's where I am going. Hallelujah. Are you going there? I ask you. 
Are you heading heaven, Lord? I ask you. Are you heading towards Jehovah? I ask you. Paul is heading towards that place. He's climbing the ladder. And I, I just say, God, thank you so much. Lord, I want to get there. I told you last time I was here, if you may remember, I said, when I die, pity the guys are going to be around. Maybe you're going to get the funeral guys to come and do the work. But if they don't come, digging my grave is going to be hard work. But when you finish digging the grave and you put my body into that coffin and you seal it, and then you cover the, the grave, the grave's tomb should read this. Henry Luke Orombi walked with God and he is not because God took him. Henry Luke Orombi walked with God and is not because God took him. My deepest desire is like Paul's desire. I imitate to this man. I want to walk with Christ. I want to suffer in Christ. I want to move on. I want to press on because I want to get there, friends. I, I want to see you there. I want us to meet at the feet of him who is at the top of the ladder. And when we start praising there, we shall be able to know that it's a long trip. But I forget what lies behind me i forget my failures i forget my struggles i forget my pain i forget my ridicule i forget my insult i forget all those things i even forget my achievement i want to press on because i want to look ahead if you are a runner and you are running with a group of people you don't look back at who is coming after you know you look on you look ahead that is the way to go paul is saying keep pressing on keep pressing on and get to that goal someday and god in Christ will say, well done, faithful servant. Now, that is a ladder. And Paul looked at it, and Paul understood. What about the angels? The angels are going from down to up, from up to down. I'll explain what they are doing. These angels are cheering us, are encouraging us, are there to keep on pushing you. When you get so thirsty, they give you a cup of water. When you are so frail and you don't know how to make it, they energize you. This, they protect you as you walk. You know that the Bible in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, write it down. They are ministering spirits. They minister to the needs of the saints. I will even confirm tonight they have ministered for you without you knowing. They ministered for Jacob. He did not know it. He did not know they were all around him. He was lying down on the ground. He was having a pillow of stone. But they were all around him. So that when the staircase came, they started from him to God. And from God down. And they're showing to him, you are not alone. We are around you. And I find this encouraging to me because I'm going to give you some incidences in the Bible. If these ones do not convince you, God will give him a harder one to you. Number one, turn to Joshua. Joshua chapter 5. When God needed to deal with Jericho, God sent an angel to come. When God looked at Joshua and he saw his faith, he was wondering, God, how is this going to work for me? He sent an angel to come. Joshua chapter 5, and I want us to look at verse 13. We are looking at a man who was a warrior, a fighter. I love this guy. I identify with him because when we look at the spiritual warfare, you need warriors. You really do need warriors. Look at verse 13. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked him, are you for us or for our enemies? Verse 14, neither, he replied, but a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. This is going to be victory because God has sent me to lead you, Joshua. When Moses handed over to you, you did not know what to do. When you came to River Jordan, you went with the priest, and the priest stood in the water, the water opened up. But when, when, when Moses was passing through Red Sea, he lifted up the stick in his hand. Now, I, I also mentioned this to you, that he never handed the stick to Joshua. He did not. We don't even know where the stick is. But he handed authority. And the authority is the sword. Because during that time, Joshua was a fighter, whereas Moses was a shepherd. Now, the man from heaven is also having a sword in his hand. It is a sword which speaks to sword. The stick speaks to stick. This guy stood with the sword and it was already out in his hand, ready for action. Joshua challenged him because he's a warrior. He said, are you for us or against us? He said, I don't take sides. 
I am the commander of the Lord's army and now I'm here. Which means that Jericho, you see big as it is, very strong as it is, the Lord will put that Jericho in your hand. He fell down and he began to worship. He said, what does the Lord, my Lord, have for me? He said, remove your sandals. The ground there is holy already. The presence of God is here. I'm not preaching on that, but this is the angel, the warrior angel. In the Bible, the warrior angel is called Michael. The, the, the messenger angel is called Gabriel. But this is a, a person who has come from heaven to help. That's a ministry. And I know, I know, friends, you might never know he has been at work in your life. There are times people plotted your downfall. He was there. There are times you escaped from accidents from border to border. He was there. There were times you expect when you travel on the road and the taxi overturned and you were safe. He was there. He fights for God's people. Look at Psalms 34. Psalms 34 and verse 7 will give you a reassurance that you will never ever forget 34 verse 7. Same angel is working. Verse 7 says these words. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And he delivers them. Protective power in the presence of a heavenly being is around us all the time. We may never know, but it does not matter. God knows your security. God is in charge of your security and my security. And God will take sure and make sure that a child will travel from point A to B. A child will sleep in that house and will sleep soundly. A child will sleep out in the open field where the roof is a sky and he will have a dream and he's going to learn a lot about what God has for him. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him to deliver them, to deliver you, to deliver us. And here is protecting Jacob from any dangers that would come in that place. Let me give you the next person. He's called Gideon. Turn to Judges chapter 6. We are looking at another man and this man, as you would know, is not a warrior like Joshua. No. This man, if you want to know, is a coward. Real coward. Real, real coward. Maybe like Jacob running away. Do you know what the guy was doing? The guy was threshing wheat where they press wine in a hiding place. And that is the activity of a coward. Now listen to what the angel is going to say to him in verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. A mighty warrior hiding from the Midianites? Oh yes, a mighty warrior. A mighty warrior threshing wheat where they should be pressing wine? Oh yes, a mighty warrior. You think you're a coward, but God sees you as a warrior. You think you are a failure, but God sees you as a success. You think you lost it? God says you have got all of it. Mighty warrior. My friend, this guy's hair all stood up. Mighty warrior. Now listen to what he says. Pardon me, my Lord, he said. Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, not with me, but with us. You see, he can't even take it all. The Lord says with you, Gideon. Now if the Lord is with us, not, not with us, with you. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all these wonders that our ancestors told us about? And when they said, didn't the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midianites. Now look at verse 14. It will thrill you. The Lord turned to him and he said, go in the strength you have. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Am I not giving you authority? Am I not going to be with you as I led Joshua to overthrow Jericho? Am I not with you at all times? Go in that strength you have, but Lord, you saw how I'm hiding. You saw how it is so hard for me to even thresh this wheat out there. Because the Midianites will destroy us. I am a coward. He says, no, you are a warrior. I will declare these words on you. Your life will take a turn. Your life will go a direction you never imagine is possible. Your life will succeed where you never thought success is possible. Your life will reap what heaven gives to people and not what people say about you. Your life is going to be a powerful victory. Because from a coward, you're going to be a warrior. Even in the weakness of your body, God is going to give you power. It is not your power. It is your availability. He has the power. Go, he said. Am I not sending you? 
I am telling you, this story is lovely. Do you know what Gideon decided to do? Gideon said, now Lord, if you have spoken to me, if you have, he didn't even say, Lord, if you have spoken to me, you sit here and wait for me. He went and made some food. I don't know how long it took. By the time you kill a kid and you bake and you do some bread without yeast and you come back, surely it's not less than two hours. He was waiting for him. Have you heard that story? It's an amazing story. He was waiting for him. God waits. God never panics. God is never in a hurry. No matter how long it takes. You are the one who is troubled by time. He's never troubled by time. He lives in eternity. He sat there and waited for him. So when he brought the food, he said, put it on that rock. Then pour the soup on it. And he did. And, he took, and this guy got up with a stick in his hand. He wasn't even having glorious appearance and wings flapping around. No, he wasn't. With his stick, he pointed at the food. He touched it. Then fire came from the rock. That was already a sacrifice. God is saying, I accept your sacrifice. I also accept you. And as the smoke was going up, he ascended in the smoke. Now do you realize... Even this angel was with Gideon all the time. He did not know it. The angels of God are always around us and we don't know it. Father, I ask you will open our eyes. Lord, I ask our eyes will be open to see your angelic beings. Father, we want to have interactions with your people from heaven that you deposit around us and you deploy especially in the city of Kampala. On our roads all the way to Kabale and then to Mbali. And these roads all the way to Gulu and Lira and Arua. Our roads are killing roads but let your angels go ahead of us. That is Gideon. Let me give you a woman. There are two men there. Let me give you now a woman. If you turn to Luke chapter 1. And I want to look at verse 26. There was a big expectation going on at that time. There was prophecy after prophecy going on that the Messiah would be born, that the Messiah would be conceived by a, a virgin girl. So I think there were many virgin girls with high expectations and really preparing, but the day has now come. Verse 26, chapter 1. This is a day never to be forgotten by this young Nazarene girl. Verse 26 says to me here, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. A virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Look at verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored the lord is with you i love positive statement from heaven you are highly favored you are honored by heaven and the lord is with you now this is a poor girl and she's a she's she's a poor girl she's a virgin she's only wanting to get married maybe then she can have some supply from a man who's going to marry her this is a very simple but humble hearted guy and now the lord says to her through this angel gabriel Favored of the Lord. Favored of the Lord. You are favored of the Lord. Amen. The Lord is with you. Amen. Mary did not understand the whole thing. This was a bit too much for her. Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, now listen, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Hallelujah. Oh God, thank you so much. You remember the humble. You remember the forgotten. You remember the nobodies. You do not look at the outward, you look at the inside. You understand us where we don't understand ourselves, where people don't understand us. You are going to be having God in you. You are going to be a co-worker with the heavenlies and you are going to conceive. This guy, this girl doesn't even know about conception, by the way. She was so troubled. She said, but I've never even seen a man. I don't know what it means to have sexual relationship. She said, that's not the problem. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And the one who will go into you is the Holy One of Israel. Praise the Lord. Amen. And he's going to Nazareth in the north, my friend. You know, we northerners, I come from the north myself. I think there's something about northerners. 
This girl in Nazareth is receiving a messenger from heaven to be a co-worker with God, to incubate the Son of God in her womb for nine months, and then walk around. And you know, the man was, when he got to know she was pregnant, the man wanted to put her off. The man did not want to keep around a woman who is unfaithful until an angel of the Lord came. He said, don't be afraid, Joseph, to take your wife Mary. For the one that she has is a son of God, and she shall bear a son. And his name will be Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. She's carrying this Savior. And you are going to be a helper to the incubating machine of God called Mary. You are going to protect that one, and you are going to provide security around her and transport you are also a man walking in the blessing. Now, if God is calling you to be a co-worker with him, receive the calling and walk with it. Amen. Then we notice another one is in, in Acts chapter 12. Now, Luke and Acts are written by the same person, by the way. Dr. Luke. Chapter 12 and verse 4. We are looking at a different kind of angelic intervention in the life of Peter. Chapter 12, look at verse 4. After arresting him, this is a Herod arresting Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to, the, to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out of the public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. A praying church, Father's heaven, unlocks the door of heaven. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. Simple preacher from Galilee. And sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared. Now I can tell you, he was always there. He, he was in prison there. But he appeared. And then light, of course, shone into the room. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell on Peter's wrist. Hallelujah. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you. It's a bit cold out there. And follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. And they went through it. When they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel pulled back into eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. They come out for us to see, and then when they are done, they pull back into eternity. Now, Revelation opens a little window into eternity for us to watch heavenly activities. That's why you need Revelation. You need God to give you the insight to open and see inside eternity. He pulled back. Now we, can, we say he disappeared. No, he didn't disappear. He was around. Peter realized he was walking with the free man. The chains all fell off. The doors opened by itself because heaven is in church. Now these are the angels going from Jacob to Jehovah, from Jehovah down, helping saints as they climb up in their faith, as they grow up in their faith, as they push on. The pressing on is a bit tough. Paul, you can remember him. He was beaten. One day he was beaten and was left for dead. Believers came, surrounded him, prayed. The guy got up. He was healthy again. He was still ministering. The guy could not say no to God. No matter what situations he went through, he kept on going. He kept on going. Then he said, I've run the race. I've fought the good fight. All I'm waiting for is now the crown of glory, of righteousness on my head, because I'm done. He had got to the top of that ladder. He had faced God now. Now he's finished. May you finish well too. May the Lord take you up to the end of your journey. I want us to look at the Father, because I need to finish with the Father. The Jehovah God was at the top of the ladder. He introduced himself to Jacob. I'm the God of your father, Abraham. He knew this is a God. You remember when he met Moses, he said, I'm the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses was so frightened. God never easily comes out to people, my friend. If the president of this country were to tell you, tomorrow come to the state house up here and have lunch with me. 
At the moment he's campaigning, but if he were to say to you, tomorrow come and have lunch with me, I don't know how many of you will sleep. I don't know what kind of dress you are looking for. I don't know what kind of makeup you want to put on. I do not know what kind of dreams will cross your eyes. I don't know. But the night will be tough. The president of only 38 million Ugandans? Jehovah God, creator of heaven and earth, is introducing himself to this Jacob God. Why? Because he's blessed of God. The Lord is blessing him already. And he says, the ground on which you are lying, I already give to you. Look west, look east, look south, look north. I have given you that. And then children, after descendants, will come out. They'll multiply. I have spoken to your pastor. Pastor, you will live to see these things happen in your own lifetime. God is not a liar. God who brought you from Nigeria to our country, he brought you because... You are a blessing, not only to Nigeria, but to other parts of the world. Amen. That is the blessing given to Jacob and to Abraham. Your descendants will bless all nations. And I dare say, my brother Ben, it's not only Ugandans who will worship in the sanctuary you're going to pastor. Other people will come. Kenyans will come. Tanzanians will come. Congolese will come. Sudanese will come. White skin will come. People from the Oriental Cup will come to you. They'll come because the Lord has blessed your life. In 10 years you have seen that you can trust God. That when you trusted him, he never put you to shame. When you walked with him, he has never turned his back to you. If he can bring you from the valley of Bunga to the, to the hill of Nakasero. Isn't he God? Is he a liar? Isn't he faithful? My brother... I, I don't know why I get so excited about you. I just don't know. There are not many people in this country I get excited about. He's promising land, he's promising children, and this God is promising security. In verse 15, we are going to go back to verse chapter 28 of Genesis. Listen to what he's saying to this man. And this is going to be yours. I want you to take it as well. Genesis 28 and verse 15, these words are moving. I am with you. He's not saying, I will be with you. That's out. I am with you. I actually have been with you without you knowing. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. Lord, do that for each one of us tonight. Amen. This journey, Jacob, you have not even finished it yet. You're on the way. You have not even reached your destination. Many of us are still on the way. But I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I am a promise keeping God. I will fulfill my promise. I will fulfill my promise. I wish I could tell you my own stories. But I've already preached for one hour. And I don't think I should stretch it any further. Let me tell you what the response was from Jacob. Jacob in that morning picked his pillow and made it a pillar. He picked his pillow and made it a pillar. And then began to worship God. He poured oil on that pillar. He named the place Bethel. It used to be called Luz or Luz, depending on where you went to school. He named it Bethel. Meaning the house of God. If you come to my home in Nebi, my home is called Bethel. We named my home Bethel in 1992. We did not know that God was going to start doing things in that property. People come to my home now, say to me, Archbishop, we now understand why you did not retire in Kampala. Because you have a better place to go back to. I'm not going to brag because what I have in my compound, I never paid for it. I cannot say I sweated for it because I did not. But one after another, the God who promised land to Jacob, the God who promised land to Abraham, gave me a compound, a compound, which is 31 acres of land. It's a compound. I'm not talking about a farm. He gave me a compound, which is 31 acres of land. I am not a farmer. I am a preacher. I am not a businessman. I am a preacher. I am not anything else. I market Jesus. So he gave me the compound according to the word of God. I will give you this land. 
He gave me land not from my ancestors. He gave me land from his own collections. And then he created homes in that land. My fence compound is four acres of land. None of my own biological children live in that home. Like he said, then I'm told, your daughter is in Australia? Yes. Your offsprings are blessing other nations. Where they have gone, they have gone with the God of their parents. And they are serving God among the Australians. Mine, two of them, are serving God in America. Because they took the God of their parents to America. Another one is serving God here in Kampala. Listen, my beloved. May the Lord do that for you too. May the Lord favor you tonight. May the God of heaven fulfill his promise for your life. This man said to God in verse 20, I want to read verse 20 for you. He made a vow. If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothing to wear. So that I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God. God, if you, if you fulfill your promise to me. And I know there are quite a large number of people here for whom God has fulfilled his promise to you. He has. He said you are going to be my God. You are not going to be my father's God. You are going to be my God. I am going to be your worshiper, your follower, your child. Not only that. Look at what he's going to do. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. Bethel. And all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. It may start with a tenth. It will go to 20%. It will go to 50%. It will go to 100%. I met somebody who is giving 200%. Not just 10%. Why? Because of the faithful keeping God who never turns his back to his promise. He is very faithful. He said, I, I, will, I will be yours. You'll be my God. And I will give. I'll give. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Because it's biblical here. Jacob said, I'll give. He's making a promise. Is God going to fulfill his promise? We shall see that tomorrow. I'm coming back again. Lord Almighty, Father in heaven, I thank you that I'm speaking to our people I can see with my naked eyes. What I see is not what you see. What you see, they don't even understand. When you address Gideon, a mighty warrior, in his heart, he could not see it. When you send Gideon and say, go in the strength you have, in his heart he was saying, which one? I don't have anything. Some of us may be looking at ourselves like, jo like Gideon did. When you met Joshua, you said to him, I've come as the commander of the Lord's army. I have come to do the will of the Father for you. That Jericho which looks impossible, that Jericho is a possibility. That great, great city is going to come down because I am going to lead you. Lord, lead your people. Lord, walk with your people. Lord, meet their needs. Lord, give them food. Lord, give them clothing. Lord, give them security. Lord, give them favor. Lord, be their God. Lord, be the light in the time of darkness. Lord, be their protection in the time of fear. Lord, give them strength when they are weak. Lord, for those who feel this is a message, yes, but I can't own it. Print it in their hearts with fire. Let them know this is their message. And it is for them you are speaking to this church. Bless Pastor Ben. Bless Mama Charity. Bless the team around them. Lord, will you raise them so that the fulfillment of this promise, Ugandans will see. People in Africa will see. The whole world that you love will see. Because you never turn your back to your promises. And I know it is true. I have seen some of it, Lord. These people will see some of it as well. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Can we stand up as that bishop leaves? Just keep clapping.
me fall down. It is written, The Lord is our light and salvation. Whom shall we fear? The Lord is the strength of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? When the enemies, even our foes, came up to eat our flesh, they stumbled and they fell. Lord, I ask and I pray, as many who are connected to this altar, as many whose hands are directed towards you now, Lord, I pray that this night, as many that will rise up against you, they shall fall before you. Every devil that wants to attack you tonight in your dream, by the power of the Most High God, such people shall be slain with the sword of the Spirit. From this altar, I assign angels to protect you. Thank you. 